So for those of you that are long time members of the channel or have been busy trawling through some of my older videos, then you may be aware that I actually did already review the Land Before Time a few years ago. But that was my first review on this channel and to be honest, it was kind of shit. Also another reason to tackle this film once more is because the wonderful YouTube copyright system <coughs> has blocked it in some certain countries and has also gave its monetization to Universal Pictures. And even though that I don't currently make any money on these videos, I would still rather not have the small amount of ad revenue money the video makes go to the billion dollar worth Universal Studios, especially when they're the studio responsible for creating these god awful things. Anyway, that's enough backstory, let's get on with the review and take another look at The Land Before Time. The Land Before Time is a 1988 animated film focusing on the lives of a group of young dinosaurs who work together in order to seek a place of sanctuary called the Great Valley. The film was directed by Don Bluth, who had recently left the Disney Studios, and was being produced by none other than Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. As the film begins and the opening credits begin to roll, we follow this small aquatic creature as it swims through the watery habitat. This creature serves no function to the plot itself, but seeing it narrowly avoid death shows the audience that this is a hostile world full of many dangers. And though we know that this film is set in prehistoric times, it doesn't actually set itself into a specific point in prehistoric times. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot of dinosaurs featured in this film that didn't actually exist together in real life. If you're a dinosaur nerd like me, you'd know that the Apatosaurus and the Stegosaurus for example existed in the Jurassic era, whilst the Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus existed in the Cretaceous era. And if you think I'm being far too picky about that, well think of it this way. There's actually a bigger time gap between the Stegosaurus and the Tyrannosaurus than there is between the Tyrannosaurus and modern day humans. So technically, this film would be slightly more scientifically accurate if it were to feature humans. But I'm sure the filmmakers knew this and this detail was overlooked as it's more marketable to feature the more famous and iconic dinosaurs together. Or you know, maybe Spielberg just doesn't know anything about dinosaurs. After all, his later movie Jurassic Park actually featured most of the dinosaurs from the Cretaceous era, so should have really been called Cretaceous Park. Just saying. Anyway, I went on a bit of a tangent there, so back to the film. We're introduced to our main focus of the film, a baby Apatosaurus named Littlefoot, who is the lone offspring with his remaining herd, which now only has his mother and two grandparents. We then jump forward a few years where Littlefoot is a little more grown up, and spoiler alert for the franchise, this is the only time we ever see him grow at all in the entire series. We learn from his mother that the land is changing, which is leading to less and less food. So they're heading out to find the legendary Great Valley, a place which has plenty of green food and is also safe from predators. We don't know exactly how this place manages to keep predators out, so we'll just assume a wizard did it. Whilst Littlefoot wanders off to play, he comes across a young triceratops named Sarah. Get it? Whilst the two are playing, her father interrupts stating, Come, Sarah. Three horns never play with long necks. Which shows there seems to be a class system amongst the dinosaurs. Also seems like a good time to point out that the film's characters will often refer to names and objects with characteristic nicknames, such as long necks, three horns, sharp teeth, and the bright circle. Which I find to be pretty creative and helps us get an idea of the world's perception through the eyes of the dinosaurs. Despite what their parents told them about playing with other dinosaurs, Littlefoot and Sarah bump into each other and begin playing in some bubbly goo. All seems fine and good until... <laughs> the 
this actually leads to a pretty tense scene with Littlefoot and Sarah trying to hide from the sharp tooth. But funny enough, this chase scene was actually cut down in production as producers thought some of the chase scenes would be deemed too scary for kids. And you can actually kind of see that cutting in the final film. There's one key moment in the chase scene where the sharp tooth loses one of his eyes due to a thorn branch snapping into it. But if we look back at the chase scene, we actually see him already with the injured eye before the branch struck him, indicating that certain moments were swapped around in order to fit with this new cut. But it does make me wonder what parts were cut for being too scary, as the fight scene that follows between Littlefoot's mother and the sharp tooth has some interesting and intense moments, like when the sharp tooth leaps through the air onto Littlefoot's mother's back and is visibly seen ripping a chunk of her flesh out. Jesus. But in all seriousness, this fight scene is one of the highlights of the movie. The music, the animation, the lighting, it's just awesome. Littlefoot's mother eventually manages to best the sharp tooth, but they're not out of the woods yet as a violent earth shake yep, they call it an earth shake, strikes the land, causing it to split, leading to families like Sarah's being divided. Other families like Littlefoot's, however, get divided in a different way, leading to one of the saddest scenes I find in any kid's movie, the death of Littlefoot's mother. Now I said this in my old review, and I'm going to say it again in this review. I think the death of Littlefoot's mum is more emotional than the other famous character deaths such as Bambi's mum and Mufasa from The Lion King. Whoa, 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 let me explain. Although the deaths themselves could be argued as equally impactful, it's the aftermath which I think gives the land before time the edge. After Bambi's mum dies, we cut to years ahead where everything is bright and jolly and we see Bambi all grown up and fine. In The Lion King, Simba almost immediately meets Timon and Pumbaa, where we get an uplifting song of Hakuna Matata, where we see Simba growing up in a paradise. In The Land Before Time, however, we don't get that immediate relief of happiness. Littlefoot is all alone in this harsh world, and spends the next couple of scenes moping around and mourning the loss of his mother, mistaking his shadow for hers, walking around in her old footprints just to get her scent, even getting rejected by Sarah when he attempts to befriend her. This was so sad that even psychologists upon test screenings found this to be a bit too traumatic. So the filmmakers include an additional scene where Littlefoot receives some comfort from another dinosaur, but to be honest, I really don't think it helps that much at all. It's not until Littlefoot meets Ducky that we finally begin to see some lightheartedness trickle back into the film. Ducky is a Sorolophus referred to in the film as a big mouth, but also a swimmer. Despite the terrifying world our heroes live in, Ducky has a very joyful and optimistic view on it, though she can be a little naive at times. Soon after meeting, they run into a petrodon named Petrie, who is unable to fly. Petrie I think was meant to be the comic relief character in the film, as he comes across as a bit more of a crazy gag sort of personality, but honestly... I don't think his comedy works much of the time. We then cut back to Sarah who happens to stumble upon the seemingly dead sharp tooth that they fought against earlier. In her infinite wisdom, she decides it would be a good idea to charge against what she believes to be the dead body. But uh, wouldn't you believe it, he's alive. Yep, despite falling a great height into what seemed to be a fiery pit of doom, the sharp tooth somehow managed to survive completely unharmed. And how did he manage to do that? Did it. Sarah manages to escape and runs into the rest of the gang, telling them that Sharptooth is still alive. Littlefoot says that Sharptooth is dead and that Sarah is merely trying to wind them up. Whilst the two bicker, Ducky comes across an egg which hatches into a Stegosaurus, to which she names him Spike due to him being what they refer to as a Spike Tail. Spike being newly hatched doesn't yet talk and is purely motivated by food to the point where the only way they manage to coach him along is by tempting him with berries. The next portion of the film, it focuses on the young dinosaurs searching for food. They come across a small patch of green food, only to have it stolen away by other dinosaurs. They then stumble across a lone tree and work together to reach the leaves from the top, except for Sarah. 
They then all bunker down for the night, where we get a heartfelt scene where originally, the other dinosaurs choose to sleep near Sarah instead of Littlefoot, as they believe she can protect them from the shark tooth, but then gravitate back towards Littlefoot, showing they favour their friendship over their fear, with even Sarah eventually joining them. The peace doesn't last long however, as they get a rude awakening from, you guessed it, the sharp tooth. Oh and I guess I forgot to mention that throughout the film, Littlefoot carried along a tree star that was originally given to him by his mother. I guess the reason I forgot to mention this is because it doesn't really play a part in the film. It's noted that the tree star is very precious to him, but then at this moment it's randomly destroyed. The camera even seems to do a slight dramatic zoom on this to signify that it was important. But the thing is, it's never mentioned again after this. But as I mentioned earlier, the film went through extensive cutting before being released. So maybe there was additional scenes which focused on this side plot a bit more. The gang manages to escape the sharp tooth through a small tunnel, and Littlefoot apologises for not trusting Sarah that the sharp tooth was alive. They then see a landmark of a rock that looks like a long neck, indicating that they are heading the right way towards the valley. Despite this reassurance, Sarah soon starts to doubt Littlefoot and decides to go her own way instead. Thinking Sarah's way looks easier, the rest of the gang decide to follow Sarah instead, leaving Littlefoot to carry it on alone. Things however don't go well for the rest of the gang, as Peachy falls into a tar pit, Ducky and Spike get stranded on the lava pit, and Sarah is being attacked by a couple of what they call dome heads. Luckily Littlefoot isn't too far away and manages to rescue them all, even managing to play a bit of a prank on Sarah in the process to which Sarah skulks off, knowing that she messed up. Again, I think this is another part of the film that must have suffered heavily from footage being cut, as the whole separation of the gang to the sudden rescue by Littlefoot literally happens within the span of a minute, almost making the scene feel pointless in itself. Apparently in the original cut, Littlefoot did actually manage to find the Great Valley by himself, but then went back to rescue the others afterwards and there's still evidence of this in the final film, which I'll get more into detail on in a bit. But for now, back to the film. Littlefoot, Ducky, Peachy and Spike come across the sharp tooth once more, but this time, rather than running away, they decide to end him once and for all. They notice a small pool of water that has a deep spot in the centre, so plan to lure the sharp tooth there and then drop a boulder on his head to send him to a watery grave. Ducky lures the sharp tooth to the water, whilst Peachy offers to distract them. And whilst getting blasted by some sharp tooth's nostril air, Peachy suddenly learns to fly. Incredibly well, by the way. How did sharp tooth's breath suddenly enable Peachy to become a great flyer? A wizard did it. Littlefoot and Spike, meanwhile, are struggling to push the boulder off the cliff edge, but thankfully, Sarah comes back in the nick of time and they manage to score a direct hit on the sharp tooth but not before the sharp tooth grabs Peachy out of the air and takes him down with him. He was my friend. Poor Petrie. But oh no, Petrie's not really dead. How exactly did Petrie escape the sharp tooth's jaw, swim out of the lake and climb back up the cliff within the span of a minute? A oh, who cares, it's a nice scene. The film then suddenly cuts to a shot of Littlefoot looking incredibly depressed despite, you know, just defeating the sharp tooth, where he admits to his mother that finding the valley was just too hard for him. Following the spirit of her in the clouds, however, leads him to the Great Valley, where Littlefoot, Sarah, Ducky, Petrie and Spike are said to have lived there happily ever after. As long as you ignore the sequels. Now I mentioned earlier in the review about how certain scenes were jumbled around as the film was being cut down in production, and the ending highlights this the most. Originally, Littlefoot was going to have his vision from his mother after he and the rest of the gang separated to go their separate ways. Littlefoot would have then found the Great Valley by himself and then makes the ultimate decision to go back for his friends to rescue them from the tar and lava. And there's actual evidence for this still in the film itself. First up is that if we look in the background of when Littlefoot is talking to his mother, we can still see the boulder sat on top of the cliff that the gang drop on the sharp tooth's head giving evidence that this scene was indeed meant to take place before the sharp tooth fight. A second piece of evidence is how after Littlefoot rescues the gang, the narrator describes Sarah as being too proud to admit she'd gone the wrong way. Sarah was still too proud to admit that 
she'd gone the wrong way. Which would make sense if in the original cut, Littlefoot had already discovered the Great Valley by himself, but in the final cut, neither of the two had found the valley yet, so it doesn't really make much sense as to why her way was considered wrong. And whilst we're on fun facts about the film, did you know that originally the Great Valley was actually going to be a metaphor for the afterlife? And the only way the dinosaurs reached it was by dying in the film? Yeah. Kinda getting onto the depressing levels of plague dogs right there. But you know, it does make sense. As I mentioned earlier, the dinosaurs give nicknames to words we use, like calling the sun the bright circle of life. So it wouldn't be too far of a stretch that they would refer to heaven as the Great Valley. And it would explain the plot hole of why there are no predators in the Great Valley. But going back to the film, despite all the cuts and idea changes, the final product is still amazing. The animation is fantastic, especially when compare it to what animation quality Disney was thrown out at the time. The style and lighting captures the tone perfectly, and the music is just the icing on the cake. From the intense score we get during the fight scene with the Rex, the mellow theme that plays as Littlefoot's mum passes away, and the choir finish we get as we see the Great Valley for the first time. The Land Before Time certainly stands the test of time, and I would highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. Hey guys, thank you for tuning into this review. Please hit that like button if you enjoyed what you saw, and comment below your thoughts and speculation of what you thought of the film, and perhaps leave me a suggestion as to what you'd like to see in a future review. Be sure to check out my other reviews appearing on the left side of the screen here, but until the next one guys, take care.